Today is Thursday, August the 27th, 2020, and the location of the interview is in Walla Walla, Washington. I am interviewing Kevin Davis, uh, a veteran, leaving the service as a second class petty officer and an E-5. Uh, Kevin served in the U.S. Navy from 1985 to 1992 and the Oregon National Guard from 2001 to 2000. Uh, he was born October 13, 1966. Dixie Ferguson and Vic Phillips, the videographer, are conducting the interview today. We represent the Blue Mountain chapter of the American Red Cross in Walla Walla, Washington. So uh, just to repeat, Kevin, uh, what war and branch of service did you serve? During the war, I was in the National Guard. Uh, for the Iraq. And Iraq war. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Enlisted. And uh, that would have been, the enlistment for Iraq would have been 2001? Yeah, I joined right after September 11th. And you were one of those 9-11 mm -hmm. recruits. Uh -huh. uh, I, I'm curious at that point. When you enlisted, were you meeting up with a lot of those because of 9-11, the same thing? Oh, yeah. Lots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A bunch of us from work, actually. Uh -huh. Curious, uh, did you think at that time your destination was going to be the Middle East? I knew it was going to be the Middle East. I was really surprised at Iraq. I assumed I'd be going to Afghanistan. Uh -huh. So, because after September 11th, you know, we, Iraq wasn't even on the crosshairs anywhere so <laughs> so when I got my orders in 03 uh, to go to Iraq I, by then of course by then we were in it uh, OIF-1 Operation Iraqi Freedom the, the the invasion had already taken place we were the second wave to go in second wave. Okay, we'll get, we're going to get into that uh, okay oh just that yeah it just surprised me Iraq surprised me uh, yeah. I, I just had no idea you know? <laughs> that's what's what's called joining the military surprises mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, where were you living at the time that you enlisted uh, just a few blocks from here actually oh. right here on Walla Walla mm -hmm. uh, born and raised here no I was actually I was born in Phoenix Arizona mm -hmm. I moved up here to Dixie Washington when I was I don't know, about five years old mm -hmm. I think it was around 71 72 and uh, that was culture shock Going from the slums of Phoenix to Dixie, and I loved it. And then we ended up moving into Walla Walla, and and I was lived here till I was about 15. Ended up in Salem, Oregon, till I turned 18, and uh, dropped out of high school and joined the Navy. All right, <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, common story. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, you 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 did join the Navy first. And that was 1985. I'd like to know why the Navy. You know, I was my brother was in the National Guard at the time, my older brother, and and his name Dean Davis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, for some reason I'd gotten in my head in high school that I wanted to be a Navy diver. So when I quit school, I, just before I quit, I was a senior in high school, and I didn't quit because of school. I was actually enjoying school. I quit because of my home life, and I wanted to, I, I wanted to get, I wanted to get on with out of there, and uh, just before I dropped out, I took the ASVAB, the, the, the Armed Forces Vocational Aptitude oh, Battery, the okay. ASVAB. Uh -huh. I took it to get out of class, and uh, the night before I left home, I got a call from a Navy recruiter that said, hey, I've got your ASVAB scores, and I said, well, good, are they, you know, how are they? And he said, they're incredibly high, I want you to come in. <laughs> so, but uh, got up here to Walla Walla, my brother and I, Dean and I, are, are, are sitting around one one afternoon, and we're like, "Hey, let's go join the Marine Corps." Yeah. And so we <laughs> we called uh, Marine Corps recruiter. It's like, "Hey, we both were brothers. We want to join the Marine Corps." And for saying yes, is we were high school uh, graduates, and we said, "No, we were both dropouts." And he told us they're they're not taking dropouts. That kind of shot me into reality. I thought that I thought the service would take anybody that was able-bodied, and. Uh, so I called up the Navy recruiter and said, uh, you taking high school dropouts? He said, come on down. So, and surprisingly, I ended up getting into aviation. So instead of Is that what you wanted? Well, my stepfather raised me, and he was a, he was a pilot in the Air Force. And he flew B-29 bombers out of- Really? Uh, yeah, out of occupied Japan after the war. Really? Mm -hmm. He was an older guy. And uh, 
fascinating guy. Uh, was stationed in Germany, got flew reconnaissance planes, got some of the first pictures of the Berlin Wall going up. Wow. Uh, our house looked like a museum because he was stationed in Pakistan. He was stationed all over the world, and we had just the neatest stuff. And so I just, I he had a plane. We flew all the time. And so I just had a thing for aviation. So when it, when they started offering me aviation spots, I was like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll get an aviation. It's natural. Yeah. So uh, even as a younger guy, you, know, you enjoyed planes. Oh yeah, my whole life. Mm -hmm. The house was, yeah. Oh yeah. Had a lot of influence there. Mm -hmm. uh, was your stepfather alive when you joined the service? Yeah. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He uh, he was very he was very proud of me. I. Uh, I went to see him, he got cancer, and he was at the VA up in Seattle, and I went to see him. I was stationed up at Woodby Island, the Naval Air Station, and I went down to see him before he passed away. And mm -hmm. Had some good conversations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was tough, yeah. but... Uh, uh, may I ask, uh, how, how long did he have cancer? Oh, from diagnosis till the time he passed away was probably less than a year. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, getting back to the, your first days in service, uh, where did you do your uh, basic training? I went to, uh, in the Navy. I went to basic training in uh, San Diego mm -hmm. in, the, in the spring of 85. I signed up in 84, went in 85, and uh, went, to San, went to San Diego. I spent eight weeks down in San Diego. How, eight weeks? Eight weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, not bad, huh, San no, Diego? No, in the spring? no. It was in the spring. It was, it was beautiful weather. Uh, it wasn't, since I'd been geared up to join the Marine Corps, I didn't find Navy basic training all that tough. Uh, <laughs> when every, down the street. Yeah, every time I, it was funny because I had a lot of guys coming up to me, uh, really just, well, I got to get out of here. I can't take this anymore. And I would take them over to my upstairs barracks window. And I would show them the Marines across the fence, and I was like, I was going to be over there. That's 13 weeks, and uh, I said, you know, I was prepared to do that. I can do this. You can do this. It's not that hard. I okay. people thank me for my service, and it really bothers me sometimes because I, the Navy, I was a high school dropout. They took me. They took a chance on me. I I made the best of it. I you know I wanted to you know I didn't want to let them down you know because they gave me a chance, and so I really uh, just. I loved being in the service. I was on aircraft carriers. I worked on jets. I, they took me all over the world. I mean, it was fantastic. I mean, the hardest part was being away from my wife and kids. Uh, so, uh, so just backing up just a little bit. So you were eight weeks at Naval Training Center, mm -hmm. and then did you get your assignment for aviation after that? No, no. I went in with a guaranteed aviation. Oh. I was an aviation electrician. Uh, so from there, I went to. Naval Air Technical Training Center in Millington, Tennessee, right outside of Memphis. Where? It's the Naval Air Technical Training Center in okay. Millington, Tennessee. Millington. Yeah, it's right outside of Memphis. It's, uh, That's a new one. <laughs> yeah. So I spent the summer. I got to spend the summer in Memphis, Tennessee. So. Uh, what did you like? It sounds like you like basic training. I, I didn't necessarily like it, but I didn't find it all that grueling either. <laughs> uh, then uh, going to Memphis. Then uh, how long were you there? I was there about six months. And you were learning specifically what? Uh, aviation electri uh, electrical systems. And that means? Uh, just general aviation electrician. Uh, we had electronics techs that worked on the electronics. We basically just were wire chasers. In the planes? On, in the, on the aircraft, yeah. Any kind of aircraft? Yeah, I was, yeah. Uh, they teach a general, general electrical systems. Avionics, uh, anywhere from anti-skid brake systems to, to back then we had inertial navigation systems. It was before uh, GPS and all that. So, but it sounds uh, like you learned a lot. Yeah, you know, it was it was uh, I think three schools I had to go to, three courses I had to take down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned, did you get? Were you married at the time? Yeah, yeah. I, no, I wasn't. I, <laughs> I back that up. Uh, <laughs> I. I had a girlfriend and she was pregnant, so I knew I was going to have a son, mm -hmm. or I knew I was going to have a child. Mm -hmm. And so my priority was to get through school, get stationed somewhere, and then and then get get her there and get married. And that's what you did. And that's what happened. All so. right, all right. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and, oh, just, we're okay. still married to this day. It's been we're 34 years. Uh, 34 in years. Counties. And how many children? Three. 
Great. Uh, while we're at it, do you want to name names of your kids? And your wife? <laughs> my wife. <laughs> your names? Uh -huh. uh, my wife's Teresa, and my oldest son is actually my stepson. Uh, his name is Andrew, AJ. And then the son that we had when I first joined the Navy is Dustin. Dustin. Mm -hmm. okay. and, our, and our youngest son, Jareth. And, and Jared? Jareth. Yeah. Jareth. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, excellent. Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, could you give me a typical day, if there was a typical day when you're in Memphis? What was it like? Food, living conditions? Oh, it was, it was horrible. It was incredibly humid, and uh, we uh, we had to be in dress uniform all the time. So down there during the summer, it was dress white. Why? And uh, just because we were new and. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the punishment of. You spend all you know. You spend all evening uh, pressing your whites, and then you walked out in ninety-eight uh, percent humidity. And you know, but uh, the schools were tough. They were very, very, very tough courses. Uh, I did enjoy them though. But then after you know, unless you had duty afterwards, it was, it was just basically just going to basically going to college. Mm -hmm. uh, was it a lot of math, like things you liked in high school, or? No, it was all it was all hands-on technical. Uh, first course was basic electricity and electronics, and uh, and then aviation electrician A school. A school. Aviation. Yeah, they call it A school. Yeah, yeah uh -huh. Navy calls them A schools. Uh -huh. And where we just learned specific systems. We had a hangar full of A4 Skyhawks that we'd go down and work on, uh -huh. and uh, they were they were tough courses. Uh, it wasn't the toughest course I took in the Navy, yeah. but uh, that was later on. But uh, it. I think I left there. In, I left there in December. I finished up in December. And to I, go where then? I got orders to Whidbey Island, mm -hmm. in Oak Harbor, Washington. Yeah, to do what there? I was assigned to VAQ-137. It's a electronic warfare squadron. We flew. And what What do they do? We flew EA-6B Prowlers. Mm -hmm. and, Checking uh, the oceans. No, we were actually electronic uh, jammers. We 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 jammed radar. Systems. Can you give me an example of that? What that means? Well, we would uh, we would we would put these electronic pods on these aircraft, and I, I didn't work on those. So I'm not exactly sure how they were. I mean, it was all classified anyway. But they uh, we we could fly these prowlers, and and our electronic countermeasures officers would pick up uh, enemy radar, and they and and they could pick what band it was, and they could they could put these jammers and it would actually jam their their radars it would it would uh, it would just basically make us anybody in our sphere of influence or electronic influence invisible to radar is amazing huh so was was that I mean was that something that was really a big is it was an issue and it still is an issue that's stuff that's still going on oh yeah well they you know they came out later on with stealth aircraft and then you know and then the other uh, then you come up with countermeasures to to counter the stealth and then you come you know it's just any any technology like that's so fleeting because as soon as you come up with it the enemy comes up with a counter <laughs> for it so uh, did you spend your whole time uh, at Whitby or did you go out on the aircraft or you were Assigned at Whidbey. Well, our, our our squadron was stationed at Whidbey Island. Mm -hmm. uh, the Navy's kind of strange with their aircraft carriers. They 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 have their ships personnel, and then they have their air wing personnel. Mm -hmm. When the ships in port, we would leave to go back to our base, and he, all the aircraft came from all over the United States, the different squadrons. And then when the ship would pull out, we'd pack up all our gear and fly over to where the ship was, go on board and do our operations. When the ship would pull back in, we'd pack up all our gear and fly back. And we, I was unfortunately stationed on an East Coast aircraft carrier. So <laughs> we had to fly across the United States. Every time that ship went out, we'd pack every nut and bolt and book we had and fly. Was, did you go to, was it Norfolk? No, actually, my first, well, I was later on. My first ship was out of uh, Mayport, Florida, out of Jacksonville. It was the USS Saratoga. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so <coughs> you okay? So, how long did you spend at Whidbey before you moved on? I was at Whidbey. I was actually at Whidbey for uh, six years. Oh, so you were going? That was your home base. That was my home base. Gotcha. And uh, and we'd fly out of there every day. And every then, day. Mm -hmm. We well no we well we'd fly missions and and do training locally. 
and then and then when the ship pulled out, we would go, we'd fly our whole air wing down there and go on board the ship for whether it be for two weeks or a month or six months. And then when we pulled back in, we'd fly all back back to Woodbyon. <laughs> so. And uh, always aircraft carriers. Yeah. Of course. Uh, all kinds of planes on the aircraft. Back right. then, yeah, we had uh, we had A7 Corsairs, we had F14 Tomcats, uh, S3 Viking anti-submarine warfare planes, us the electronic jammers. The big ones were the were the A6 Intruders, the the bombers. Mm -hmm. By the way, just on a silly side note, were there a lot of Tom Cruise types that were the hot dogs? No, <laughs> no. I was in during that Tom Cruise <laughs> film. Yeah, yeah, during Top Gun and and all our. <laughs> I was uh, I was in an A6 squadron at that time, and all our A6 pilots had these bumper stickers that said that said F14 pilots make movies, A6 pilots make history. Well, right after that, they came out with Flight of the Intruder, which was about A6 intruders over in Vietnam. So that's funny. But, oh uh, yes. I anyway. On a side note, I probably saw it three times. <laughs> That's a confession. Anyway, moving right along here. Um, in those six years, what were the highlights for you? A uh, big one. Well, it was my first three years. I was on sea duty. So when the ship, I was on station on, on the Saratoga. So brand new to Woodby Island convinced my girlfriend to marry me, brought her up yeah. there with our then two kids. And uh, and then I said, uh, I gotta go. And she says, where, what, where are you going? I said, well, I have to go on board the ship. <laughs> she said, how long are you gonna be gone? I said, well, we got a month. And she knew nobody. Uh, we, we had an old Chevy Nova stick shift that she just learned how to drive a stick shift. And uh, didn't know anybody in town, didn't know anybody anywhere in the Northwest. She was from Eugene. And so I, I had, and I left, and so it was kind of a shock for her. Mm -hmm. uh, did she stay there? Yeah, she stayed there. Mm -hmm. So we did workups. So we'd go out on the ship, and we'd train for a couple weeks or a month on something, and then we'd come back, and then we'd go out the next month and train up. And that's called workups, getting ready for uh, for cruise. So then, just weeks before our first wedding anniversary, I left on a six month cruise. Tough. We forget the military families too often. That's yeah, a tough one. I, 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 I absolutely love the military, and uh, the hardest, the, the absolute hardest part was leaving my family. Absolutely. And uh, not watching the changes. Did she stay on base the whole time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By then, she'd been meeting people and making friends and stuff. Sure. So uh, I think it was get adjusted. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little yeah. bit. Uh, <clears throat> where did you go on your assignments? All over. Yeah, my first cruise was uh, was uh, I was on the six in the Sixth Fleet, which is the Atlantic, and we did a we did a six month cruise in the Mediterranean in '87. We left in June of '87. Was there anything nothing really going on at that time? Was there? Well, when I first joined the squadron, they were out on cruise the year before, and they had all kinds of things. They had the Gulf of Sidra down there with Gaddafi. Uh, bombed him. Okay. Our, our yeah. aircraft bombed him, and then uh, we had the Achilles Laurel incident with the hijacking. Oh, yeah. Uh, Saratoga was involved with with that. Yeah. Uh, and there's a couple other incidences. That was President Reagan's. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, and then uh, so in '87 we went out there. I was there's so much to talk about. There's <laughs> our fleet admiral, our battle group admiral was Admiral Jeremy Borda, Mike Borda. He was the CNO under President Clinton. Mm -hmm. Fascinating guy, and I got to meet him a couple times and uh, on on board the ship. And he was such a great guy, he would, he would get on our intercom system. Anytime we did something, he would tell us what we did. Otherwise, we'd have no idea. We, I, I would have thought our cruise was absolutely boring. But he came on and told us some of the things that we did, and it was, it was amazing. Yeah. So I really, uh, I really he liked him. He did it personal. He did. He really did. He was, really, he was a, a very amiable guy. B-O-R-D-A? I mean, B-O-O-R-D-A. B -O -O -R -D -A. Borda? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike, uh, Mike Borda. Mm -hmm. uh, he joined the Navy as, a, as an E-1, as an enlisted. He lied about his age, joined when he was 16. Decided he didn't like it, wanted to get out. They told him, nope, too late, you're in. And so he ended up working his way all the way up to Chief of Naval Operations, Amazing. the highest rank he can get. Amazing. Like I said, I got to meet him a couple times uh, up on the flight deck, and 
got to shake his hand and, and, and talk to him for a little bit. And just an amazing guy. I, I but, would say, uh, real personal. So in 87, so we go out in the Mediterranean and we did do a few things out there. Uh, one of them was we shot down a U.S. Air Force F-4 Phantom. Because? Because we're Navy. <laughs> so, <laughs> Did you explain we, that? Okay, we, uh, <laughs> and the Admiral Border told us about this. We, one, day, when, one day my buddies and I were walking down, down uh, the hangar bay going to, to eat, and we see this green drop tank. Uh, it's, a, it's a drop uh, fuel tank, external fuel tank. And it's painted green, and it's not ours. You know, all our stuff is gray. And we're looking at it, and it's all smashed up. And we're like, huh, I wonder where that came from and what that's about. Well, that afternoon, Admiral Border got on the 1MC, the intercom system, and he said, well, as you know, we're, we're forward deployed, so we always go fully armed. All our jets all are bristled with bombs and missiles because we're, this, we're, we're the carrier on station. You know, so we were playing NATO war games with, uh, with our allies over there, and the Air Force, the U.S. Air Force base out of Greece was playing the aggressor squadron, the bad guys. They were playing the Soviets. This is back during the Cold War. So we always had Soviet trawlers around us, surveillance trawlers. They were... Uh, so this F-4, this F-4 Phantom was coming inbound towards the Saratoga. One of our F-14s dropped in behind it, got a missile lock, and the guy fired a missile. He fired a, a Sidewinder missile. Yeah, Is it, was he still in the service? <laughs> as, yeah, that's, yeah. I just read about him last year. They were going to make him an admiral. He never got out. He, yeah. I said, I know that guy. He, uh, <laughs> anyway, shot the, shot the Phantom down and uh, our search and rescue helicopter went and picked up the pilot and the, and the radar intercept officer. They, were both, they both ejected safely, landed in the water. Our, our SAR helicopter picked him up, brought him back to Saratoga. So Admiral Porter said him and the CAG carrier group commander and the and the captain of Saratoga, the three the three wise men, three big chiefs <laughs> of a battle group, <laughs> uh, all went down there when they and said, "Do you know what happened?" And both of them said, "No, we have no idea what happened." One minute we're flying, the next minute we're swimming in the ocean. And then he said, "Well, we we shot you down." <laughs> so dad, we had tough explanation. We we laughed about it because they, you know because nobody was hurt. So but mm -hmm. except for that F fourteen pilot. That'd be a, some heavy expl explanation, yeah. Department of Defense. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, my were, goodness, uh, did you uh, ever feel th really threatened by the Russians? Yeah, that was later on uh, on the USS America up in Vestfjord, Norway. That was another cruise. And what was that about? It was just a North Atlantic cruise that we did. It was later on in my, in my, in my travels. <laughs> were they aggressive? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, they were always aggressive. I mean, it was the Cold War. We were always uh, doing. You know, it was it was just dangerous time. You know. But. Um, you're saying dangerous time. Um, I mean, you really did feel threatened that they could possibly do something. We we were up in Vestfjord, Norway. I was. I, Could I, you say Vest? Vestfjord. Vestfjord, Norway. Yeah, okay. I was up above the Arctic Circle. We, okay. uh, I'd been transferred. Our, I'd been after our cruise. We went over to the USS America, CV sixty six, and that was out of Norfolk, Virginia, and I didn't like Norfolk, Virginia. <laughs> After Florida, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> so in '89 we went, uh, we we operated down the Caribbean for a month, and loved it. Uh, anchored off uh, Guantanamo Bay for a couple of days. That was pretty neat. And then we steamed up to uh, Norway, and we were doing operations up there in March of '89. What kind of operations? I mean, just flight operations. We just we would. We were like we were the carrier on station, so if something breaks loose, we were the guys that would go. You know, it's like okay, who's the who's the nearest aircraft carrier? Send it. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know Persian Gulf, wherever, where, whatever's happening, whoever's. Mm -hmm. So basically, we're just like a, a, a floating military base that can respond to wherever we need to respond to. And there's always one in the you know in the in the Atlantic and the Pacific. You know, every fleet has a has a battle group usually out on on station. And we'd stay out until the next one would come out and relieve us before. And we that's still. Do you think that that is still going on? I don't think it's much. I think there's a lot of times when there's a lot of gaps in coverage. I mean, this was back in the Soviet, you mm -hmm. know, with the Soviets. So one day we were we were operating. It was really neat up there. Uh, it was in March. Every night was the Northern Lights. Every night, all night. It's fascinating. But one day, 
of an entire fleet of Soviet bear bombers came over the hill. And what are bear bombers? They're they're heavy bombers. Oh. They're like they're like their equivalent of the B fifty twos. And uh, low leveled, they completely caught us with our pants down. They they fly nap of the earth and they flew right over our aircraft carrier. And uh, basically it was like if they would have dropped bombs, they would have destroyed us. Wow. You know, they were just showing that they what they wow. could do. Wow. But wow. uh Jeez. We did have one really another cool incident over that Admiral Gordon told us about. Uh, or the, we knew something was going on. I was I was working at night on the aircraft carrier on the flight deck, and right next to our plane we were working on was this S three Viking. It's a it's an anti submarine warfare plane, and all these guys were taking all this gear out of it, and the admiral and the captain of the of the Saratoga were standing there watching them and they were discussing something and we're kind of like trying to get close to see what they're talking mm -hmm. about and <laughs> and then they took the stokes litter and they set it on the on the what flight is it, a, stokes a, litter? a litter mm -hmm. oh. it's like a big yeah you know carrying casualties uh -huh. big metal framed mm -hmm. monstrosities they laid a sailor down in it they took another one and they put it right over the top like a clamshell and they locked handcuffs around it because oh. it's made out of metal tubing so here's this guy in this <laughs> locked in this like a sarcophagus and we're like, that's awfully strange. So we're, we knew something was going on, we didn't know what. So the next day, Admiral Borda got on the 1MC and he said, okay, this is what, we, this is what we've been doing. The CIA caught, they, they, they found the terrorist that was involved with the, the Achille Laurel hijacking the year before. They found him in Spain. They posed as drug dealers and these, and these terrorists were financing their, their terrorist operations by dealing in drugs. So these CIA operatives, disguised as, as drug dealers, lured this, this, this terrorist out on a yacht, went out into international waters, arrested him. Our helicopter went and picked him up, brought him back to the Saratoga. They emptied out a, uh, an S3 Viking of all the electronic gear that was not necessary. They clamshelled him inside two Stokes letters. They put him on board and they flew that S3 from the Mediterranean all the way back to the east coast of the United States without stopping. Really? They, they in-flight refueled the entire way. They, they were they were afraid of landing in any country and then not being able to fly out with them again. Do you have any idea what ever happened? No, nope. I heard they put them on trial and threw them in prison, but I never got wow. to. I never verified it. That's but. pretty amazing. So they made S three Viking history. It was the longest S <laughs> three nonstop S three flight in history. Forget so. Tom Cruise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, wow, that's that's quite a story. Uh, of all the places that you went, you were speaking of like the physical beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like you've been pretty much around the world. Mostly that side. Uh, I never, uh, yeah, I never went to the, side. never went to the Pacific. Yeah. I always any, wanted to. Any, any place that just really dazzled you? Oh, every place. The Mediterranean. The first place that we went, we stopped was in Spain. Was on Mallorca Island, Palma. And it was absolutely beautiful city and beautiful country. And, and uh, we went to Naples, Italy, right there, Mount Vesuvius. Uh, and that was really neat. We went to one of the greatest, neatest places I went was Athens, Greece. Oh, yeah. That was great. Went to Alexandria, Egypt, Benidorm, awesome. Spain, we went, uh, <clears throat> Israel. We went to Haifa, stopped at Haifa, Israel. Israel was. Well, what did, what did you do there in Haifa? Just dock? Just drank. <laughs> we, we would, uh, we, <laughs> we, yeah, we pull into a port and, and then we. <laughs> Sailor in port. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The stories are all true. We had, and the Israelis are saying, "Oh no, here they come again." <laughs> yeah, went to several several ports in France. Went to Marseille, France, uh, which was a big working city. That was an incredible experience. Uh, went to. French Riviera stopped at, at uh, Cannes, France, where the Cannes yeah. Film Festival is. Yeah. We were, yeah. uh, <clears throat> wow, what an experience for a young man. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> yeah. so your uh, your, <clears throat> your time in the Navy was coming to an end. In, in, uh, that was 92. And uh, then you got out and did what? Uh, after you oh. got out of the Oh. Mm -hmm. um, well, back. You came back in. Well, backing up, I, I was I was only on CD until '89. Oh, uh, uh -huh. One of the last things I did before I went to shore duty was 
on the USS America, we went into New York City for Fleet Week oh. in 89, and I got pictures of me and my buddies on the oh. World Trade Center in our dress blues. Oh, my goodness. So. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, Little yeah. Little did you know. Yeah. So, wow. but. Wow. Tell me, just really briefly, what is that like in New York to be honored uh, and wined and dined? It was amazing because they told us we had, we, since it was Fleet Week and we were there as, as you know, in representatives of the service, we had to wear our dress blues. <laughs> and they were really uncomfortable to wear. And everybody was complaining, but <laughs> it was the greatest thing ever. Walking around in dress blues in New York City and Manhattan was amazing. I mean, everybody rolled out the red carpets for us. I mean, it was just awesome place to visit when you're in the military. Yeah, <laughs> I can only imagine. Did you come into the harbor and everybody's mm -hmm. lined up? Yep, on the lined carrier? the rails. Yep, I was lining. Yep, I was. I was manning the rails. What a sight with so. the Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was amazing. To the harbor. We went. <laughs> We're standing in line at the Statue of Liberty, and there's this young guy in front of us wearing a U.S. Air Force Academy sweatshirt. And he turns to us and he says, "Hey, you guys are off the aircraft carrier." We said, "Yeah, we're off the we're off the uh, America." And he said, "Did you guys hear about an incident where an, where a Navy plane shot down an Air Force plane?" And we just started <laughs> roaring laughing. And he's like, "Well, what's so funny?" I said, "Well, that was us. We did that. It was on the Saratoga, and it was two years ago." Oh, gosh. And he said, well, I just, I just graduated the Air Force Academy, and they briefly touched on it, but they didn't give us any details. And we said, well, we'll give you all the details. We'll tell you what. What a small world. So. And you're on the USS, USS America coming mm -hmm. into the harbor. How, how good does that get? Oh, it was amazing. New York City was just amazing. I, I wouldn't live there on a... <laughs> you can pay me enough to live there, but boy, for three days, you know, or four days we were there for being a sailor, and, you know, it was yeah. just fantastic. Yeah. They, uh, Plus, I was, you know, I'm young. You know, I'm young yeah, guys. sure. Good. Great experience. Um, so you did shore duty up then until '92. Yeah. At Whitby Island. I was an instructor of aviation technology for three years. Okay, great. So I went from a high school dropout to a, a wow. teacher. Wow. So I taught for three years. Wow. Did you like that? Yeah, it was pretty. Uh, yeah, it was a tough school I ever went to. Was the was the instructor course? Uh, it was a thirty day course at Bangor Sub Base, and that was interesting. Being going to the to the uh, Boomer Base there. That's where the, the I'm sorry, where the Bangor Bangor uh, Trident Submarine Base. Oh, where is that? Bangor, Washington. Oh, I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't know that was there. Yeah, that's the that's the big missile boats. That's the that's the ones that carry all the all the nuclear missiles. I oh. And uh, that was a. Something new. 30-day course. It was the toughest course I've ever taken in my life. Got six college credits for it. Wow, crash course. Mm -hmm. And wow. it was an accredited intense. course. It was very. It was incredibly intense. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I taught for. I taught for three years. Good. Well, they saw star quality to have you go through the school. So fantastic. And that kind of led to me going to Iraq, actually. Can you move into that then? So, my brother. When I joined the Navy, he went ahead and went active duty Army. He got out of the National Guard and went into the Army and ended up uh, going to Desert Storm in, what was that, 91? So I was an instructor, I was on shore duty, and we were all watching the war. Uh, I worked with a bunch of Marines, so it was Navy and Marine instructors, and so we were all watching the war every day on the TV, and, and I knew my brother was over there. Well, one day they came to they came to us and they were looking for an E-5 electrician to go over to be a supervisor for a, uh, on one of the carriers on station. I can't remember which one it was. They, they needed one of us. And it was basically down to me and another guy. And it was volunteer. And I went home and I told my wife, I said, hey, I've got a chance to, to go over to the Persian Gulf uh, for the war. And she's like, do you have to go? And I said, no, it's volunteer. And she says, well, you better not volunteer then. So she basically gave me an ultimatum. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So the other guy went, and it was probably a better fit because he was single, and uh, and he went, and he enjoyed it, and he, you know, so. But, uh, you know, fast forward to Iraq, you know, when I got my order, she says, I, this is probably because I didn't let you go to the first war. <laughs> so. <laughs> So that Wait a minute, you, I'm sorry, you said you did get orders with the, with the National Guard? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, that? so, yeah, but, well, yeah, so back in the, yeah, so I, uh, 
she was under the impression that if she'd let me go on that first time <laughs> to the Persian Gulf that uh, on the aircraft carrier that I would I would have got it out of my system and uh, it would have been so hot to go to war the second yeah. time. So it's probably true, but <laughs> uh, but there was a gap then of a few years from ninety two to two thousand one. Then did you, mm -hmm. you got totally out of the service? Yeah, then? we got totally out. Uh, came here to Walla Walla. I went to work at the penitentiary mm -hmm. as an officer mm -hmm. and uh, immediately got. A, uh, got a call from an Oregon National Guard recruiter. There's a, a Chinook helicopter squadron stationed out of Pendleton, Oregon, mm -hmm. CH 47s. And he called me up and said, I see you just got out of the Navy and that you're an aviation electrician. We can MOSQ you right in. You can become a helicopter mechanic. Don't have to go to school or anything. And, and, and my wife said, Oh, you should join because, <laughs> you know, you like that stuff. And I said, Yeah, but, you know, I'm, 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 I just. I don't want to go National Guard, and whatever reason, I can't remember what it was, I just didn't want to go at the time. Mm -hmm. So when the attack September 11th happened, I got on the phone and called him and said, I'm ready to join. Mm -hmm. So and my wife said, oh, you wouldn't join nine years ago, you know, in peacetime, but now you're going to join in wartime. I said, well, yeah. yeah. It's a man thing. Huh? <laughs> It's a patriot thing. Yeah, yeah, and by that time it was. I mean, when I was in the Navy, I was young, and, and I... I mean, I didn't know who the president was, but I, I, I didn't consider myself a huge patriot. I mean, I loved America, but I, by the time 9/11 came around, I, I, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm joining. Fired a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And then my brother, he, he joined. Okay. And, uh, mm -hmm. A bunch of guys at work said, "Oh, how do you like? It? Oh, love it." So they all joined. <laughs> <laughs> Did they? Yeah, a bunch of us really? ended up. I think twelve. I think twelve of us ended up in Iraq from the penitentiary. Really, mm -hmm. from your work. Mm -hmm. Wow. Did you all go over together? No, no. We all went with, I was with Oregon. Uh, most of them went with Washington. Mm -hmm. so. so before you knew it then, you're on your way to Iraq. Got orders in, uh, got orders in the fall of 03. Uh, moped up in January 04. Okay, that was a few months after the initial invasion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, where did you where did you go to over there? We went uh, over there. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Oh. Where did you land? And oh, okay. Did you go right into? Iraq? No, no. We we uh, we we ended up at Fort Knox for a couple months, mm -hmm. uh, getting getting trained up. Now this is uh, Army aviation uh, mechanics for mm -hmm. helicopters. <clears throat> okay, but we did. Uh, we did all the standard Hua Army stuff. We were kicking indoors and doing patrols, and and I, that was that was that was pretty fun. <coughs> but because uh, we knew we would be doing that stuff, I, yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, flew into flew into Kuwait City. I'm trying to remember what month it was. It, I really didn't keep track of time over there because once you know when you're deployed, you just you know there's no you know. I, I think it was March of '04. We flew into Kuwait City. We were in a camp called Wolverine, and then they bust us out to the middle of the desert. They had all these little camps set up all out in the Kuwaiti desert. Uh, we were in Camp Virginia for I think ten days. Now you knew you were going to Iraq. Oh yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So, how were you feeling about that at the time? Uh, I was pretty gung ho about it. Uh, now was Dean already there? No, no, he wasn't. He came in later. Okay. So he was. He had rejoined as soon as I got my orders. He, Big Brother, he got his orders. Yeah. Yeah. So he he joined up and got orders, but he wanted to wait till his son graduated. Mm -hmm. So he said, I. He said so. He went in. He went. In, he went a couple months later. Okay. So uh, then after. Out in the desert in Kuwait, then it was time to go. Mm -hmm. So then they, we were waiting for all our gear to show up. Normally you'd convoy up. Uh, they ended up putting us all on C 130s and flying us up to our base. We were stationed at, it was, at the time it was called Camp Anaconda. And, uh -huh. and it was at an Iraqi uh, Air Force base called Balad, or outside of, outside of the town of Balad. Balad, Balad. Yeah, it was just north of Baghdad. So we flew in there at night, and we landed. Was uh, it just non-eventful getting there? Pretty much. Flew right over Baghdad. We all got to look out the window. It's the lights <laughs> of Baghdad. 
<laughs> they have lights. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> the uh, we went uh, we land we land at Blod. They put us on buses and they drove us this huge mongus base, a gigantic logistics port base. Drove us clear to the other side of the base where they had our trailers set up, our, our hooches to live in. And uh, we, we all pile off the bus and some mortars start coming in. No, just a minute. Right, right yeah, right. We're standing in this gravel parking lot. <laughs> and so wow. that excited a lot of people. <laughs> so, uh, well, what did you think? I just figured it was a combat zone. I didn't think anything <laughs> of it, but it kind of scared me because a lot of the guys that I was there with all started locking and loading their M16s and, and yeah. running around and crying, and I was like, yeah. well, you know, it's this is a combat zone. <laughs> Whatever one doesn't hit you, I guess, is a, you know, so, but... Uh, uh, what, what was, uh, uh, when you, uh, can you remember your first impressions outside the ordering? The heat, the living conditions, the whole environment. Well, I was, yeah, it, it wasn't such a shock. It's a lot like Phoenix. Everybody asked me, what's, what's Baghdad like? And I said, what's well, a lot like Phoenix? It's hot and dry and full of foreigners. So, <laughs> full of foreigners. Oh. <laughs> so, but uh, funny. It, it's almost exactly like Phoenix. Dry? Dry and hot. Now, Balad is actually up in, it's on the Tigris River, and there's a lot of green fields around us. Uh, a lot of agriculture. We we did some flying over some big uh, watermelon patches and stuff. We get the Iraqis to bring in fresh fruit and vegetables to us and stuff. I, I can't imagine growing. I don't know why watermelons in Iraq. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, so where? Uh, what was your base like? Your living conditions and and what was a daily routine for you? Well, after we actually got into it, it was really tough getting into a routine because we didn't have anything to do for several months. And so we would just try to make work. We went and loaded, uh, we went over to their side of the base and helped them load a bunch of C5s and C141s with uh, with helicopters. Uh, we'd break them down, uh, fold the blades up, and roll them up into these big transport aircraft. And uh, for the initial wave, the guys that were leaving, the, 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 the initial invasion force was all leaving. So we. They were leaving. We went and helped them out, and we just kind of made work whatever we could do, and then... Did you talk to the guys? What was that like, first coming in? Did you have conversations? Oh, yeah, yeah. With the, with the, with the other soldiers? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. yeah, we worked with them. They were, they were, they were pretty funny guys. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that would be... Their funny. living conditions were a lot worse. By the time we got in there, they had been moving in trailers. These guys were living in tents and, you know, and whatnot, but... But the routine basically was just like work, you know, go to work in a hangar and... Long and, days? Uh, for me, yeah, it's incredibly long days. And so, uh, what kind of uh, aircraft were you working on? I was like working on CH-47 Chinook helicopters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, were we, they used a lot in oh, the yeah. war? Oh, it was, un it was incredible. They were... A lot of the aircraft we worked on was a, was a unit out of Mississippi. Gulf uh, 185. 185th Aviation, really neat guys. Love those guys. They offered me. A, they offered me a job down in Mississippi uh, if I wanted. To, if I wanted to move down there, but uh, great guys. Loved them. Great to work with. But we would tear them down. We were. We were. We were eye level maintenance, intermediate level. What does that mean? Intermediate, intermediate level maintenance. We would. We would basically tear them down to the airframes and rebuild them. How about the desert conditions for aircraft? Uh, not bad. No? no, not not like in the Navy. In the Navy, you know, with the with the salt water and the sea conditions, you know, corrosion's horrible, and uh, didn't have a lot of that problems there. But sand, a lot of problems with sand. It was amazing at night when we'd spin up the helicopter, the rotor blades, uh, the dust and the sand, the silica sand would spark off them, and it would just and you just look up and look like little fireflies just sparkling. <laughs> wow, no kidding. Uh, any, I know, were you mortared? Fairly often, or was it mostly secure for you? No, every day, every day. We were, every we were, day. Yeah, we were rocketed and mortared every day. What does that mean? Uh, day and night, just mortars coming in, uh, mortars and rockets, and uh, <laughs> you're so. <laughs> the uh, I have a newspaper article at home from the uh, so cavalier every day. <laughs> the Stars and Stripes uh, did an article on our base. They called it Mortaritaville. <laughs> Mortar. You know, Mortaritaville, <laughs> because we 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 got attacked every day. And, uh, well, what does that mean? Just, you'd be walking along and boom, mortar hit somewhere, you know. Well, I mean, were there injuries, guys getting... Uh, yeah, we had some of the most, uh, we had a rocket attack come in 
that killed a lot of guys. And uh, but uh, one of the last things I did before I left was had to fix a helicopter that got rock, uh, hit by a rocket. I got pictures of that. Okay, how long were you over there? A year. Every day. Mm -hmm. Just well, every day up until Fallujah, when when the military went in and, and cleaned out Fallujah and Ramadi, all attacks stopped. And for for explain that then. The uh, well, we we're like I said, we we're getting attacked every day. Every day we'd get incoming fire, and then and then when when the Marines, I think it was mostly a Marine force, but there were elements of the Army, and all, you know, the whole everybody went. Uh, they finally decided to go clean out Ramadi and Fallujah, mm -hmm. these two cities that were basically ran by the yeah. the bad guys, and. Uh, I've, I've, the, uh, I watched these battles, you know, on TV mm -hmm. and the street fighting and, uh, mm -hmm. and the amount of U.S. killed. And, mm -hmm. uh, after they, after they cleaned them out, our, our attack stopped. And then one day it, it hit me when I got home that if they hadn't have done that, we would have kept getting attacked, and I could have died. Mm. And so, mm. there's a lot of meaning. They could have saved my life. Mm. So, wow. you know, I, I have a lot of uh, feelings for those guys that went in there. Absolutely. Yeah. Boy, that's... But we, I had, I had, uh, I had internet hooked up in my trailer. And I had a webcam, and I would sit there and talk to my wife, and I could see the, my house and the, mm. my dog, and she's <laughs> drinking a beer. And I'm, but didn't that help you, or did it? It did. It did. And uh, mm -hmm. the and so one day I'm talking to her, and this mortar lands outside my trailer, and she heard it. She said, "What was that?" And I said, "It was a mortar landing outside my trailer." And she said, "Well, are you supposed to go somewhere or do something?" I was like, "No, they." They usually shoot two or three in the air at a time, and so the other ones are already on their way, and so, you know, where are you going to go? <laughs> she must have been mortified. And so I took, my, I took my little camera over to the window, and I opened the curtain up, and I showed her the dust and smoke going up out. In the, there was an empty lot next to me, this big empty field, and for some reason they mortared that field a lot. How, how did she handle that? She seemed okay with it, I think. She, by then, she, well, she was pretty upset with me for going, so... <laughs> Oh, that's, I but, mean, I, I guess I'm taken aback that, that they were incoming just about every day, and there was no way to prevent that, obviously. No. Just no. didn't know well, they, they were well, they did. Well, they did as much as they could. These guys would set them up. They would make a makeshift mortar tube, bury it in the ground. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they put them on timers. I don't know how they... They wouldn't even be there. They'd put a palm frond or something over it, and it would just launch. <laughs> was that just basic demoralizing harassment? That's what it seemed to me because we had these really stupid policies. It was a. Uh, you ever read or watch the movie Catch Twenty Two? I, I have not. Uh, oh, you've got to. You've got to at least <laughs> see the movie. It's just a brilliant movie. It's uh, the 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 main character Yosarian. He's played by Alan Ark, and he's just you can't understand the insanity of the war. It's just the the crazy things that happen and. The guys that ran our base were a bunch of bean counters. They they were army, but they were they weren't tip of the spear. They're not they they were logistics guys, mm -hmm. and they would they would say anytime there's a mortar attack, you have to go undercover until we sound the all clear. And so when mortar would come in, and we'd go inside a hardened aircraft shelter or in, in a bunker or somewhere. Twenty minutes later, they'd call the all clear, and then another mortar would come in, and we and I said, "Boy, well, if I was the enemy, I'd do this every twenty minutes. You know, I'd, I'd lock this place down." Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. apparently, nobody told us. Just, that. just uh, uh, it's almost like a harassment and interdiction, it, like in the old days of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, something similar yeah. to that. Uh, golly, I did they ever? Well, you did say they did. They had done damage. Yeah. So some of them did do damage. We. Uh, I'm trying to remember what month it was. We uh, we had a lot of Iraqis on base. They would get cleared to come on with their trucks to offload equipment or supplies, and uh, we had a lot of Iraqis uh, working work crews. We'd bring them in, 
guard them while they did their work and they'd leave. <clears throat> and one day, my brother, one of my brothers showed up. That was that was pretty cool, and he showed up. We got to hang around for a week together, and uh, we'd go out. We went out to the North Gate where a buddy of ours from work was was working, and we went out on a patrol and. Uh, and you could see these guys that were waiting, lined up, waiting for jobs on base. And and you and and you talk to them, and, and most of them just were regular guys wanting a job. But every once in a while, you would see the one guy, and you could see the hatred in his face, or you could see the malice. The mm -hmm. and I'd be like, that that's guy, you know, that guy, that guy, that guy. But not a common attitude and animosity. No, no, I met some really neat guys over there. Uh, By the way. Uh, did you get to talk to them very often? Oh, all the time. Them? Oh, all the time. time. Mm -hmm. What did they think of us being there? <clears throat> did they share that with you? Their true feelings? No, most of the guys I talked to really didn't seem to care. It didn't matter, at you? Capitalists. Those guys are the biggest capitalists I've ever met. They, really? oh yeah, they love making money. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I, this is not a trick question, but what did you think at that point? Our purpose was for being. There. What was the mission? I, did, I, I, I still don't know. Uh, Dean and I, Dean and I have discussed it since we've been back. And if we, if we knew then what we knew now, we would, we would, I, I wouldn't have chosen to go to Iraq. If I had an option, I would have said. You no. would not. No, okay. because we weren't. We didn't seem to be in it to win it. Mm -hmm. And to me, if you're going to send, mm -hmm. if you're going to send Americans to war, you send them to win it. <laughs> You know, not My not rebuild mind. it, not not you know. Mm -hmm. uh, rules of engagement. <clears throat> yeah, rules of engagement kept changing every day. We had, uh, you know, back in 04, 04 had the worst fighting. We had we had Najaf, uh, Sadr City in, in Baghdad, uh, Ramadi, Fallujah. I mean, the, the just oh. that that year was the most intense fighting that, that they've had over there. Yeah, uh, that was the year you were there. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. We uh, interesting. It was it was it was just phenomenal. That Did you feel like um, all the <coughs> fighting that we were making progress? Well, yeah, we. A <coughs> yeah, I think we were initially, but then think, yeah, it just seemed to kind of bog down. You know, I don't and know. And do you, can can you understand why it bogged down? No, I mean I've, I've kind of studied up. I wasn't in I wasn't in Afghanistan, but I've read up a lot on it, and and, and I've watched some, some things on it. And, and initially, we were doing that right. We were using unconventional forces. We were we were we were we had we had Navy SEALs and and guys you know and, and special operations with sat phones. They would they would find these guys. They'd call in strikes, and we kept them on the run. Well, then got, then we I think it was like Vietnam. We started moving into bases and and. And building up, and mm -hmm. and being stationary, and mm -hmm. and just big fat targets out there. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, did you re think that there was an Iranian influence? Was that? Oh yeah. Could you, could you talk about um, that? I know one. Uh, one night, one of our helicopters. Uh, we had a couple of our Chinooks loaded up some uh, Chevy Suburbans. With with Navy SEALs, drive uh, flew them up to the Iranian border for border patrol. To patrol, stopping the Iranians from crossing the border. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, can you explain the the relationship between the Iraqis and the Iranians? Well, that was that was strange because like back in '87 when I was in Marseille, France, that was the year. It, it, the uh, what ship was it? The uh, an Iranian aircraft shot uh, ex an Exocet missile into the side of one of our ships, killed 37 sailors. It was the uh, yeah. Vincennes. Was the, no, Vincennes. no, not the Vincennes. Uh, the Colt. There's been so many. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> trying to remember the name of the ship. Anyway, uh, these Iraqis approached me in Marseille, wanting to go on board the ship. I'm like, yeah, you guys are going on board the ship. <laughs> so. <clears throat> uh, oh. But that was during, but that was during the intense fighting between Iran and Iraq. They, they had that huge war going on, mm -hmm. and uh, well, wasn't uh, uh, Saddam bombing Iran a lot? Yeah, they had a huge war between Iran and Iraq, and so we were, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, yeah, which right. is the stupidest foreign policy yeah. I've ever heard in my life. That we were, we were supplying Saddam Hussein because he was yeah. fighting Iran. Yeah. 
Yeah, here we are. Uh, let's see, uh, <clears throat> were you there when Saddam was captured? Yes, I think I, yeah, I'm pretty sure I was. That had to be the news. Did you ever have the opportunity to see any of these castles that they talked about? Yeah, I flew down. Uh, we would make beer runs down to Baghdad. <laughs> totally illegal. I, I'm assuming they can't get me in trouble for it this now. We would, we, we would jump. Uh, we they called it catfish air. That was Golf 185. Mississippi boys. They were. Uh, <laughs> You walk into flight ops and they'd have a board of everywhere they were flying and if they had space available you just signed up, jumped on a helicopter and flew wherever you wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And so we would make regular trips down to the green zone in Baghdad on a Blackhawk to go buy beer and whiskey. <laughs> we weren't supposed to. We'd take a rucksack and throw you know, half a case of Heineken and a bottle of Jack Daniels in a bag and jump back on a helicopter and fly home. <laughs> I never appreciated beer runs more when I got back. Than I did. But. Um, <clears throat> But you did get to see some of the Saddam. Oh, so I went down to visit my brother. He was stationed down in, uh, at the time it was called uh, Forward Operation, uh, FOB Highlander, Forward Operating Base Highlander, and it was on a cast, it was on a palace grounds. Mm -hmm. And you got to see that? Yeah, so I spent all day with Dane walking around. We did, uh, we went all through the, the palace and the, you know, what the grounds. It, what was, what did it look like? It's pretty amazing. It was, on the outside, it was beautiful, but you could see where we had bombed it, and you could see where underneath the facade of the marble was was junk. Was it? Yeah, like they had no building codes or stand. Like they empty a mortar bag, they just <laughs> shove the bag in the wall. You know. So. <laughs> well, but. they talk about that the boss and the let's see, uh, she has blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you? See see that as just something that's probably just going to go on forever. Yeah, it's like tribal warfare there. I was at the I was in the uh, I was at the bazaar there in uh, in Baghdad in the green zone and I was doing some shopping and uh, I had this one old Iraqi woman trying to sell me this Iraq, you know, head scarf thing and it, she had different colors and she starts explaining to me, "Oh, well, you know, this this red and white one is the Shias and this green and white one is the Sunnis and this black and white, you know, and it was it was just like gang colors. It was. It was basically. You know, it reminded me of street gangs back here, you know, from working with some of these yeah. gang members. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> did you feel like you said you went to these bazaars? Did you feel kind of secure in doing that? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. We we you know we, we, we you went everywhere with your rifle. So, mm -hmm. but. And one day I flew down to Baghdad and I spent the day at the at the bazaar and, and they bombed it the next day. They, a suicide bomber came in and blew it up the next day. Oh, oh. Did you get the Babylon? No, no. Famous Babylon. No, and I could have went to Nineveh and Nineveh, didn't. Yeah. I, yeah. I, was a, I was a sergeant and I was, I was running. I had a crew. Yeah. yeah. At that time, were you and a lot of guys uh, with totally aware this is... Bible. This is biblical history. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very aware. Oh, yeah. I was. Uh -huh. I don't think some of the young kids that yeah. were with me really cared, but... Yeah. But, but was that kind of surreal? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. I would have loved to have... I would have loved to have just gone there as a tourist, you know, yeah. to see uh -huh. some of the things. Did it remind you of biblical? I mean, did it look ancient or... Well, yeah. Like nothing had ever changed? Well, I'd been, you know, I'd been to Athens, and I, you know, and I'd been to Naples, and I'd been to Israel, and uh, it reminded me a lot of Israel, just the ancient, uh, mm -hmm. how, how old the antiquity. You could just feel it. It was amazing. Did you? Mm -hmm. And were there actual, um, oh, what do I want to say? The sheep, not sheep herders, but the tribes, the. Uh, oh, like the Bedouins and stuff. Bedouins, yes. <laughs> were there a lot of Bedouins? I didn't really see any, but it was it was really strange. It was kind of like. You go to Baghdad and you would see like college girls walking around in jeans and makeup, and then you go to where, uh, like outside of our base, uh, it was like going into Amish country, all the women fully dressed, yeah. you know. So it was just, it was, it was just, uh -huh. it was like in America, uh -huh. you know, whether you go to Amish country or you know, or Detroit or yeah, it was very diverse. Uh -huh. So, uh, so well, it's all very interesting. So. Uh, Getting toward the end of your tour, was that uh, the end? Of, was that in two thousand five? Mm -hmm. Were you there two thousand four, two thousand five? Yes. Okay, and you knew that 
when she got back home, that was the end of your, na you said one year, National Guard. Yeah, I was actually stop lost. My, 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 I signed up for four years and it, and my, my enlistment had been up for, I think, nine months. Well, the six, at least six months I was over there, I was actually stop lost. Stop. Lost. Stop. Lost. They didn't. They wouldn't let. You, they wouldn't let you out. Oh, stop. I never heard that expression. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, so you 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 were secure. Your job security was back at the state prison mm -hmm, when yeah. you came back home. Mm -hmm. But well, uh, those last few days over there, you knew you were coming home. Any in reflecting back on that year any highlights that you would like to talk about well we had one incident where we uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of people shipping home and they they convoyed down to kuwait and we had a big uprising so they turned them around and they sent them back and uh these guys were going home they were they were home free and they, and they turned around and they sent them back and uh one of the incidences we had, I I just been to the PX, and the uh, there was an Iraqi there. I assume he's an Iraqi, but anyway, he they think he had a GPS on him, and uh, they fired a bunch of rockets in on our PX mm. and uh, killed a bunch of guys. And one of them, one of them was a kid that was uh, was one of the kids that was turned around. Mm. It's timing. So. Uh. Yeah. He was leaving the next day. Oh, yes. So, uh, were you were you near any kind of field hospitals? I mean, any occasion to go visit anybody in the field hospitals? No, but my that was another occasion. I was I, one of my trips to Baghdad. I flew down there and, and and I walked and I was walking by. I was walking by the hospital there in the green zone, and right as I'm walking by it, I was telling my buddy. I said, I said a friend of mine from work. Is down here somewhere, and uh, I wish I knew where he was at. I'd love to come see him. And I had no way of finding out where he was at. And the next day, I found out he was in that hospital. He just got hit with an IED that morning, and I'd walked right by the hospital door, and he was just feet from me, and he'd gotten his arm blown off. He was up in the turret of a Humvee when an IED hit. And, but uh, super great guy. You yeah. got to interview him. Yeah. <laughs> is he around here? Yeah, he lives in Milton Free. Is that the one you're yeah. talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, he's a Marine. Uh, yeah. He was. He was, and, and that's what made me feel really bad was because at work he kept asking me, "How do you like the National Guard? How do you like the National Guard?" I said, oh, "I love it. It's great. It's a lot of fun." And so we tried to join the Oregon National Guard. Uh, there was a Cav Scout unit right next to us, and. They asked him some question if he'd ever been in the hospital, and he said, yes, so he had this one incident. They said, well, we don't want you. And so he came over to Washington and they, and signed up over here, oh. and he ended up over there with the Washington Guard. The Marine. Oh. And yeah, he was over there with the Washington Guard. He was a Marine, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a lot younger. He was an old, he was an old man, but <laughs> he was older than me. But, uh, oh my goodness. Yeah, uh, so. Well, in, uh, so in, in uh, coming home, Looking back, and this is a very difficult question for me to ask. You just talked about your buddy. Mm -hmm. You see the wounded warriors on television. You see them from both Iraq and Afghanistan. And we know the injuries will be for the rest of their lives. I wonder often, can you tell me what you think their attitude is today? Is that a tough question? I don't you know, I, I just don't know. I think it's just really, up, you know, each individual. I mean, most of the guys that I've come across are, you know, just hard as nails patriots, and 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 just mm -hmm. they don't seem to let it stop them. That's you know, great. that's that's so. good. I, I'm I'm glad to hear that. Um, <clears throat> well, fast forward then. So we you're coming home, Kevin. And uh, did you get any leave time? Oh, I did. Well, I did come. Yeah, I did come home for two weeks, and I was sick for a week of it. Oh, well. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that was tough going back. Uh, I was, you know, two weeks here in Walla Walla, and then I had to go back. And, sure. and uh, oh, you bet. But the hardest, the absolute hardest part, was the day my brother left my base. He he was convoying down to his base in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. 
and I'd just spent a fabulous week with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had these big hardened aircraft shelters that looked like giant cement clam shells, and you could walk up the side of them because they were domed. And uh, remember, mm -hmm. it's okay. <laughs> remember the day he left, I climbed up to the top of the, mm -hmm. the they called them hosses. H A S Haas uh -huh. Hardened Aircraft Shelter. And I climbed to the top and I sat up there and I watched this convoy uh, leave the south gate. And I've never been so depressed in my life. I didn't know if I'd ever see him again. He was a he's, he was eleven Bravo. He was infantry, so he was patrolling the streets of Baghdad every day. And I never know. I didn't. I didn't know if I'd ever see him again. Very emotional. And the, Have and you shared that with him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it had to be tough for him to leave you too. And then and well then, I, I left Iraq about a month before he did. I knew he was going to be there for an, probably another month, at least month, six weeks, and and it was really hard to leave country without him. Absolutely. I, I actually thought about going AWOL, catching a helicopter flight down to Baghdad, and just mm -hmm. staying down there and coming back with his guys. I probably would have got a lot of trouble yeah. for that, but you know, but I really needed, would be legitimate. You know, I really needed to get home to my family. So my sure. wife, when I first got orders, she was used to the Navy, and we had a six-month deployment. And she said, "So when I came home that day, and I told her I got orders for Iraq, she was, she was really upset." And mm -hmm. she said, "So you're going to be gone six months?" And I had to tell her, "No, mm -hmm. a year." Yeah. So yeah. I was gone about 14 months. Don't. Yeah. So. Huge, huge sacrifices. Hopefully, never getting a knock on the door or a phone call. Huge. Yeah. My. And we, boy, we just. We honor the we don't honor the military families enough my, recognition. My youngest son was he was fifteen when I left and he was seventeen when I got yeah, home. That's tough. That's tough. Yeah, mm -hmm. lots of sacrifice. So yeah. and then yeah, he's gone now, so he's gone. He, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He he went into the he went into the army. He was a he was Lem Bravo and uh, Oh he joined the army. Yeah, yeah, he he joined the army and, and uh he ended up committing suicide in 2009, so. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I did not know that. Yeah, he was 21, so. Oh, Kevin. That, that year that I lost with him, mm -hmm. you know, just. Mm -hmm. But, at, I always say you do what you do for the reasons at the time, and mm -hmm. sometimes we forget those reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, uh, my little philosophy just, yeah. Uh, life and you don't want you just it's hard no, I mean it's and also I also wonder if you know if, if I hadn't have gone if he would have joined and went mm -hmm. you know so what is your wife uh, I mean this is on tape mm -hmm. but does your wife does she talk about that on occasion oh yeah yeah I'm sure yeah sure. we we talk about it all the time sure. we uh, sure but well I'm very very, very sorry about that. I had no idea. What was his name? Jareth. Jareth. Okay. Mm -hmm. He was the youngest one. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was my baby. Yeah. He was my baby I'm boy. Very, very sorry. But he, was he compelled to join the service by you and Dean's influence? That's what I wonder. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. But, but he was a great soldier. He, he uh, really yeah, he really tore it up. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, just to honor him for just a couple of minutes, uh, <clears throat> Uh, did he go into combat then? No, it's 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 kind of a convoluted story. He he was he was they were his unit was shipped into Iraq and uh, they were getting shots and the medics told everybody if you've got psoriasis don't get this shot. Well, he had a bout of psoriasis like like uh, on his skin a few years before that and. He said, I've got psoriasis, I can't get the shot. And they said, well, it's not on your record. And so he said, well, I had it. And they said, well, we, we can get you for false enlistment because you didn't tell us. And he said, no, I wasn't ever diagnosed with it. I'm just telling you I had a skin condition. That... So they forced him to get the shot and he had a breakout of this psoriasis. And so they kept him behind. And so while he was pulling duty at Fort Lewis, he was one of the only guys qualified to guard some post, some point they had. And he was married, his wife was pregnant, her mother was living with him on post, and uh, 
my son was pulling guard duty like 12 hour shifts and then when he'd get home he couldn't sleep because he was dealing with his wife and mother-in-law mm -hmm. and lots of stress he ended up going about 30 days with almost no sleep oh. and uh, I think that was the mm -hmm. and, and he felt horrible about not getting to go he, that's all he wanted to do was go that's but, tough and, that's tough you know, so I, he, got, he got left behind, you know, and he, that's all he wanted to do was go into combat, and he got left behind, and between that and the lack of sleep, and the, you know, and just, I, it was just... Too much, huh? Oh, you know, perfect storm, yeah, so... Yeah, yeah. That's a very, very, very hard story. I'm so sorry about that. Well, his, he had a heart for the service and for oh, America. Yeah, he did. And, yeah, he really did. I'm sure he's a fine young man. His older brother, my my son Dustin, he he's in the National Guard now, and and uh, he's got two MOSs. He's a he's a cat scout and a, an infantry. Uh, just got back from training up on a new sniper rifle. Uh, what a family! He loves it. He <laughs> what a family! That kid is so gung ho. It scares me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got an amazing family. What a military legacy. Well, you're back at work at the uh, state mm -hmm. prison now, mm -hmm. and are you pretty close to retirement, prison? Oh, I'm shooting for probably six years, six more years. Maybe. Six more years, I'll have to go. And uh, uh, is there anything that I missed to ask you uh, that you would like to add at the end of the audio? Mm -hmm. No. No, I just, I, I, uh, the hardest, you know, the hardest, I, I actually loved the military and I, and I, 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 uh, the families, I was always the guy leaving, you know, I was always the guy that was getting on a plane or getting on a boat and, uh, then when I, and, and I didn't realize how hard it was until I started seeing my sons leaving and I was the one being left behind and then I realized what I put my, my family through, and it's a lot tougher being the one left behind. Yeah, yeah. My wife's an amazing woman. She uh, she had to do everything, everything. Uh, when I left for Iraq, my house, I swear my house was possessed. The day I left, uh, water pipes broke, uh, my sliding glass door fell out. Uh, her and my son, Jareth, were standing in the kitchen, and a cupboard door fell off and hit him in the head. Oh. <laughs> no, that's I mean, awesome. a covered door just fell off and just yeah. it, the, it was it was just she didn't know uh, the, the refrigerator broke down the, the stove quit the it was just it was amazing it was it was like a real test yeah and she had to do everything she was working full-time uh, you know our son was 15 and he was the other two the older boys were gone mm -hmm. and uh, you know she's trying to raise him and, and and deal with the house, and deal with working, and dealing with me being gone, and, and super strong lady, incredibly strong lady. So. Well, Kevin, all I can say, boy, it's a huge team effort. You're doing your part for the country, and she's the huge support system, and it's all just a great big national effort, isn't it? It is. It is. Mm -hmm. And I wish, you know, I wish I could do more. You know, well, I really you've do. Done. <laughs> but you've done incredibly more than your share. Um, we ask a lot of our, our brave hearts and you've, you've served well so uh, 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 Vic do you have some questions you want to ask? Well have you ever joined any uh, service organizations? I was in the VFW briefly and I let my membership lapse and I keep meaning to rejoin <laughs> but I, uh, I'd, like, I'd like to get reacquainted back with the VFW uh, we give to Wounded Warriors. Uh, What's one of the charities we give to? Uh, I thought briefly about starting up a, a program, but I just I was so busy. I then I wanted to. After reading Lone Survivor, Marcus the Trail uh, about a dog that he had uh, there at uh, Bethesda when he was in the hospital recovering, uh, I wanted to start a dog program for vets. Oh, what but a uh, I know other people are doing it now, and I, and I, yeah, I love them for it. And fantastic! So. Uh, any reunions? Have you done any reunions? Stay in touch with your buddies? No, uh, no. Of course, you got the guys out here. Yeah, I got this guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we did. We had a little get together at Dean's house last last year. We had uh, mm -hmm. 
there's probably half a dozen of us out there uh, mm -hmm. had a little get together and talked about talked about things got a picture of us all together so uh, Kevin that would be worth a video that alone yeah. oh yeah yeah it was, Big it time. was good I am curious, uh, because you and Dean have so much in common, do you still share, reflect back? Oh, all the time. Do you? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talk about things we would like to have seen different, mm -hmm. you know, that the, that the military could have done or that or the government could have done or the, you know, or the, sure. our own units could have done. Sure. Uh, Dean, so I know you interviewed him and I know he, he, he told me some stories from Baghdad that just shocked me how things were ran, you know, that it just it, it really made you wonder who was in charge yeah <laughs> so. yeah, yeah that, that's for sure uh, well <clears throat> I, I would like to just ask one last question it's it is a political question where are things now in Iraq as far as you're concerned uh, I, I like the fact that we were that we were still there in a capacity to where all, back in the back back in the eighties, you know, during the Cold War, we were all geared up with the war in Europe with the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. When when I went when I went to Mobile to go to Iraq in '04, we had to wait weeks to get desert uniforms. Mm -hmm. We ended up going over there in our in our our old Cold War really? BDUs uh, because we couldn't get them. And I and I was talking to this this major over there at Fort Knox. I said, "We this is the new theater. It's in the desert. It's in Africa. It's in the Middle East. Why?" why why aren't we wearing these every day? Why is it so hard to get a desert uniform? Why why isn't that the new uniform? You know, it, we're always fighting the last war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and it took it took so many years to gear up, and that's where we're at. That's where our enemies are. The enemies of the United States are, are in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the new theater. Mm -hmm. Um, and I said it was going to be the last question, oh. but I well, go ahead. Oh, but we, yeah. to back to your question yeah. about being in Iraq. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we do need a we need a presence there. We need, but it, but but uh, in in Iraq, it's just as good a place as any. So you know, it's <laughs> it's it, it, yeah, it's right there. And uh, do you think two or three tours are too much for one soldier? Yeah, and that's the other thing that upset me was the fact that that when. When we were moving up, we we have a what's called an MTO, a T O and E, a table of organization equipment. It tells you what who you should have and how much gear you should have, and you know so many cots, so many tents. We had to completely fill this T O and E list, put everything on planes, flew it over there. We landed. They said throw it in that pile. You don't need it, and it's not going back to the United States. Mm. It's like why did we bring it? Mm. Why did we wait weeks to get it to bring it? And uh, then when we handed off our unit to the other people, they 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 brought all their gear <laughs> and dumped it in the pile. Uh, we we the army has this thing where they have to have these year-long tours, and they don't. The Navy had six-month tours. The Marine Corps had seven-month tours. The Air Force. I talked to this Air Force kid. I wanted to punch him. He said, "Oh, I'm on my thir third tour." I was like, "You're in your third year over here." He says, "No, we only have three month tours." I said, my wife told me, "She said if you only did three month tours, you could go all you want." You joined the wrong side. I know. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think the I think the Army is is the most uh, entrenched in their in their in their ways that they can't change and it's like you need to change that's you need very to, interesting uh, i guess a very i've not heard that roll that's guys in and out of there uh you know hand receipt over your equipment to the next guys just throw me on a plane send me over there I, i'll get a rifle when i get there you know <laughs> give give me that rifle you're done with it you're going home so it kind of seems obvious doesn't it it always did to me yeah. but but yeah. you know guys yeah. are always you know like yeah, that's very interesting well Kevin, I uh, thank you, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being here today. Oh, you're welcome. I just uh, we we are so honored uh, in sitting with with our brave hearts. So thank you for your story. Oh, well, you're welcome. I wish very interesting. You know, I just went over there as a mechanic, and I just felt that was my capacity. I I. I I got nothing but love for these guys that are the tip of the spear. You know the the teamwork. You know the scouts and the. You know they're the guys that lead the charge and they're the guys that win the battles and they're the guys that win the war. But, I mean, I realize that you need your cooks and, and your you're mechanics. The 
<laughs> you know, we you know, the helicopters got to get troops in, and they got to get wounded out, and they got to get supplies in, and and that was my capacity. But and making them safe. But I always envy the guys that are doing the fighting. Because, Did you? Yeah, always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that just kind of uh, the oh, the brave-hearted men? You think? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe. Well, you could have been. You could have been just. I could, you know, I could have. I could have went in as a, you know, as an infantry, but. You know, I was older then. I was in my late thirties, and and you know, not in the greatest shape. So, and you and served your country well. You know, I was a most. I, I was a mechanic in the ar in the navy. I was a mechanic in the army. You know, I'll but be, you know what? In my opinion, there's no just anybody. Just housewife. Just cook. You're there's right. No just anybody. No, you're right. Everybody mm -hmm. has purpose. So. Uh, well, you and your brother are really great guys, so well, thank, thank you. you so thank you. much.